Uh, let me turn now and recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gonzalez, for a round of questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I wasn't going to ask Mr. Ebell uh, any question, but I, where did all those jobs go that left California? Um, you know, I think most of them uh, went either abroad or to the heartland states that have lower energy prices, lower taxes, uh, a less uh, stringent regulatory atmosphere, and have, uh, you know, I, I remember when uh, Dr. John Christie from the University of Alabama at Huntsville testified, I think before this committee, and he said, you know, California used to have a vibrant auto industry, but in 2008, more automobiles will be assembled in Alabama than any other state. We have workers and who want to work, and we have and lower Mr. Abel, the reason I ask is, look, this is the obvious, and we go round and round on these things, and I really don't get something as fundamental as why, why some jobs leave certain areas. Sometimes it's just that uh, <clears throat> there are certain concerns that are addressed in certain areas that may not be in others, and it increases the cost of labor, um, such as fair wages, a living wage, mm -hmm. safe working conditions, small things like that. I'm sure this country could still be incredibly productive at uh, incredibly low cost had we maintained something like slavery or maybe just forgotten about uh, child labor or safe working conditions, or minimum wage. There's all sorts of ways to reduce cost. I would like to think that we have matured and developed as a country, where sometimes we just do that which is fair, equitable, and right, even though it may increase the cost. And I think there's a, there's a fundamental philosophical difference, I think, that, that's going on here. But let's just get to the matter at hand. Dr. Cohan and, and Dr. Crutzer, the only thing that you all share is the first letter of your last names, because obviously it seems, Dr. Crutcher, you simply don't believe that there's a need to act on greenhouse gas emissions. Would that be a fair statement? I want to start off with that. I mean, I really want your honest answer, because I thought we debated that, I thought we were past it. But if that is your premise, then it goes to the very heart of maybe some of your opinions. Do you believe my, we my, should be taking any action on reducing greenhouse gas emissions? I can only talk about the ones that are being proposed in, 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 the, in this bill and elsewhere. No, no. I, cost, well, let's forget about this bill. Should we be addressing it in any form or fashion? If it's free, yeah. Okay. Well, why not? But it's not free. That's the problem. And it, and, and, so uh, what would and be the Dr. alternative? Dr. Carney said it, that this bill would solve the, the climate change problem. It doesn't even come close to having All right, so a, a you're noticeable just, impact. It's the approach that you object to, but you believe, I, as your I, colleague I next to you believes, that truly gas house gas emissions or greenhouse gas emissions truly pose a problem and, and one they, that needs they don't, to be addressed. They don't pro, I, I don't think there's enough evidence to say there's catastrophic problems coming down the road from greenhouse gas emissions. All right. All right. You know, there, there will be some increase in sea level. There will be some without greenhouse, without man-made greenhouse gas emissions rising. There will be some when we cut it back by, uh, you know, 70 percent or 80 percent. All right. And I would, I would like to have an economy that's strong enough that when we have the climate variability that we're going to have with or without climate action, that we have an economy that's strong enough to, to get through it, as we have done for the past couple hundred years. We're getting stronger and stronger. We're going to be able to handle a, a foot and a half of sea level rise. And we are not going to stop it with this bill. And that's the problem. It's huge costs, very little benefits. And I wish this committee would look at what is the benefit. If you, this isn't denier math. This isn't flat earth math. This isn't man never went to the moon math. The IPCC says that a doubling of CO2 emissions will lead to a two to four and a half degree increase in world temperature. The EPA, looking at the Lieberman-Warner bill, said that bill would lower greenhouse gas emissions from about 719 parts per million to about 695. Let me ask you, Dr. That's a point one to point But what degree. you're saying is we have plenty of time, and whatever is inevitable is something we could handle along the way as long as we, st we have a strong, robust economy. Now, mm -hmm. if you were wrong, what might be the consequence of too little, too late? And would you be, be able to even address the adverse effects 
at a, at a later date? We would be able to address that at a later date if All it right. becomes clear. That's that when I want to go to doc, Dr. Kohan. Do, do you agree with any of those basic premises? One, that it really doesn't pose a danger. We don't need immediate action. If, as, and when, we'll be able to deal with it. Uh, it won't surprise you to know, uh, Congressman, that I don't agree with those premises. I think the uh, I'm not a scientist, but uh, I read the science and I talk to scientists, and I think the science is clear that if we don't do anything about climate change, the consequences will be catastrophic, um, that unchecked climate change is going to lead to severe and real economic damages. I mean, uh, Dr. Kreutzer says uh, that, uh, solve it, that, that addressing it won't be free. The thing that won't be free, the thing that's really going to cost us is uh, the damages from climate change if we don't do anything about it. Uh, this is a problem where we are not taking account of those costs at all in what we are doing right now, um, and that is the most important problem that we have to solve. Now, if this is a global problem and this is a problem that will uh, require concerted international uh, action to address, but the U.S. is part of that community and we need to take the lead, and that is what this bill would do. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for your patience today. I, this has been absolutely fascinating to listen to and to hear the, the different opinions. Uh, Mr. Sissio, I think I want to start with you because I appreciated what you said. Uh, we should not jeopardize our competitiveness. Well, absolutely. We, we shouldn't. Uh, our organization and our companies have done a incredibly great job of continuing to reduce their energy consumption because it it's, makes us more competitive. And higher costs are okay, but you have got to have higher costs on our competitors overseas or we lose the jobs. Well, and I would like to come, I would like for you just to touch on what you think the electric industry will do to achieve efficiencies and meet the um, renewable electricity standards that are in the proposed legislation, how you balance that and how we still remain globally competitive with goods? Well, the, re the renewable portfolio standard uh, is only one part of the challenge of higher electricity costs. Uh, for one, uh, paper companies, which are some of my companies, use that, use renewable energy, the biomass, as a raw material feedstock. And if uh, electric utilities are utilizing that uh, to meet the standard, uh, it could put the paper business industry out of business. Okay. Uh, but states are endowed with different renewable resources, and that's why our view is that uh, that, should, that is the decision that should be made at the state level where they know how much renewable resources are available and at what cost. And can make those appropriate adjustments. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Kurtzer, I, when I was talking with Mr. Chu and questioning him earlier today, I asked him about the 25 percent standard and working toward that by 2025. And he said it was going to be easily achieved. So do you agree or uh, disagree with that? Well, it's, it's going to be costly. Um, we, we actually, in our analysis, we gave that away. We said, let's assume that all of the renewable standards set up by the states can be met at reasonable cost. So when we did our analysis of Lieberman Warner, this very difficult to achieve standard, we said we're going to meet that. Still, $5 trillion worth of lost GDP in 20 years, $5 trillion worth of energy taxes, 3 million lost manufacturing jobs. All of that was even though we assumed we could meet the renewable portfolio standard that was a little bit less but close to 25 percent. Okay. Um, Mr. Hayward, uh, when I had talked with uh, Secretary LaHood, I, I asked him about, and then subsequently Mr. Chu, about the low carbon fuel standard and the effect on prices at the pump. And as we look at uh, transportation fuels, and will it lead to uh, greater or lessened dependence on foreign oil? Those are two issues that we hear a lot about 
from our constituents. Uh, they're concerned about the dependence issues. They're concerned about the price at the pump. So as you look at the uh, low carbon standards, uh, what, do you, what do you think? Oh, boy, I have a hard time making up my mind about that uh, because there's so many moving parts. Uh, I mean, the big, one of the big problems to try and solve in transportation is how do we have a portable fuel? I mean, that's why we want gasoline or diesel or biofuels or something. You want something to put in a tank or in an energy supply for a car. So we, we talk a lot over the years about hydrogen. We're talking about plug-in hybrids uh, with much bigger battery capacity. We're talking now about biofuels from algae is being talked about. Uh, the difficulty here is, is, once again, if the government tries to pick winners, you may actually clog up the market for innovation. I don't know that anybody's really happy about the way the whole ethanol business has gone, including most environmentalists. But yet, we're kind of path dependent on that now because you have a lot of powerful interests who don't want to change the program there. I think that's a good example in case study of how you can actually retard progress. So. Mm -hmm. You know, I try to keep an open mind about that, but that's, I think, very hard to predict how that's going well, to Well, but my constituents say, is this going to cost us more yeah. or is it going to save us money? So where do you think that's going to come down? In the short run, it's going to cost you more, cost I Cost more. Long okay. run, I don't think anyone can say. Thank you. I am out of time, Mr. Chairman. I've got a couple of other questions. I will submit those. And we will ask the witnesses to respond in writing to those questions. The gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Matsui. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I saw a recent analysis from Mr. Knobloch's group uh, that stated some interesting facts. In 2007 and 2008, more wind power was installed than in the previous 20 years combined, and more than 70 wind turbine component facilities opened, expanded, or were announced. The renewable energy standard, electricity standard that this legislation contains is an economic engine for the future. According to the Union of Concern, scientists, and RES would create 297,000 new jobs in renewable energy development. A robust RES will drive investment to the tune of $263.4 billion in cities and towns across this country. We can achieve these economic benefits even while taking the equivalent of 45.3 million cars off our roads. Mr. Novlock, um, in my hometown of Sacramento, we are attempting to create a center of clean energy technology that will drive our local economy. And I visited a number of these new regional companies when I was back home last week. With this background, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on the job creation components of this legislation. Can you expand a bit on what types of jobs will be created with this legislation? Thank you, Congresswoman. You know, the great thing about, about the renewable electricity standard debate is that we're not dependent on modeling. We can look at the 28 states that have adopted a renewable electricity standard, and the success of that policy is, has, has been tremendous. At least half of those states have gone back before, um, uh, before the, the time limit for, for, for the uh, increased percentage of renewables and increased the percentage because they were doing so well. A state like Texas, uh, 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 years ahead of the, the, uh, when the, the time, of the time frame, went in and doubled. Uh, doubled the amount of uh, uh, renewables that they would expect from that policy, and now Texas is, of course, the national leader in wind power uh, and has uh, three times the installed uh, uh, wind electricity of, of the state of California. Um, and, and you can also look to before there was any renewable electricity standard policies, the renewable sector was floundering. And so here, what, what happened was, was that government came in, set a standard, did not pick win winners and losers, technological winners and losers. It did define what is renewables. And there are some very legitimate uh, debates going on as to what, what belongs in there. Now, some opponents of this legislation argue that new jobs would only be created because other jobs would be lost. In the case of RES, is this a zero-sum game when it comes to jobs, or are there hundreds of thousands of jobs it creates going to be on top? of the existing job figures? Well, this analysis that you're referring to, uh, uh, which is not part of our blueprint, it was separate analysis, showed that, that uh, uh, the renewable sector, that a national renewable electricity standard would pre create three times the number of jobs that would be created uh, in the same time span in the fossil fuel sector. So it, it, it nets out positive uh, when it's when it's well designed. It, when you, when you l listen to any kind of jobs analysis, you want to be sure that, that there's there's a control for what's happening in, in the economy already and, and get your, your arms around that. But uh, we're quite confident that uh, uh, whether it's uh, uh, 
you know, the, the, the steel workers in Pennsylvania who, who uh, got laid off and are now building uh, towers for wind turbines, um, truckers, people who pour concrete, um, uh, people who uh, design wind turbines and the associated machinery. There, there's, there's dozens of different job disciplines that go into making this technology. I'd like to turn to uh, something that uh, is really something in our, my district, I represent the most at-risk river city in the nation in Sacramento, and uh, studies have seen that the Sierra Nevada snowpack would disappear under a business-as-usual scenario. Um, so that represents great challenges to my district. Uh, this is to Dr. Cohane. Um, with this in mind, will you please expand on the point you made in your testimony that the threat from water-related impacts to climate change could be in the billions of dollars? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I, that was a uh, quote from a study uh, that uh, Frank Ackerman uh, at Tufts University did uh, as part of just looking at four uh, analyses or, or four types of impacts on the United States, one of them being increased water scarcity. Uh, and uh, when they added up uh, all those uh, four analyses uh, or all those four costs, the other were increased energy costs and coastal flooding, which uh, is, is important in other areas of the country, and, uh, and also increased hurricane intensity. They got uh, hundreds of billions of dollars in costs from unchecked climate change. That's what we would pay in business as usual. That's why I said it wasn't free not to do anything about this. And that's just from those four costs. That excludes uh, a huge other number of damages. So that's, it, it, that, that kind of concern uh, that w is going to be the water scarcity is going to be relevant to the American West, and there are going to be other concerns that are relevant to other parts of the country. Yeah. Well, thank you. I see my time is up. The gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I'm delighted that this is the last panel. We've had eight hours uh, almost. This uh, is not today. the last panel. Today it is the last panel today, right? No, one more to no, go. There isn't another panel. There's not another panel. There is. There is. This is an all you can oh, eat. Oh yeah, yeah. It's all you can eat. It's no. Who is on the today. fourth panel? Raise your hand. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll stay. I'm glad I asked that question. Um, my time really shouldn't be running. I was going to say that I was. Let's start. We're going to start. We're going to start. The the general was a little bit disoriented. I really didn't realize that. <laughs> I, I have this big list. I just didn't turn the page, but there it is. Um, I was going to say that I, I, I am looking forward to co-hosting with you tonight with Disney, uh, the show uh, Earth. Uh, Perhaps you'll be hosting it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why, is there another panel after this? No, no, no. <laughs> we'll they actually have the a, a the detail for us area, in, yeah. in terms of uh, our remarks tonight, so maybe I'll get your time. Anyway, I... Uh, I just want to say a couple things. Uh, for me, I, I do want to see uh, emissions reduced. Uh, I want to see plenty of incentives uh, to, pro to provide a cleaner energy for all of our citizens. Uh, but I also want it to be fair. Uh, and I don't want to put the U.S. at a big disadvantage. And the, the headlines that I cited in my opening statement uh, eight, some eight hours ago uh, with India and China not willing to to participate in every opportunity that they've been given, now, whether it's before this committee in the last year or now in public statements, I think puts our nation at a, at a severe disadvantage. Uh, and it's not that we're going to do nothing. Now, we're going to do a lot, now, whether it's with energy ap appliance standards, it's with building standards, it's with lighting standards, it's uh, with auto standards. It's, there, is, there is a lengthy list that, in fact, we are going to do a lot to reduce our emissions. And when I look at, again, what I cited this morning, and that we've had, in essence, uh, comparable growth, the United States and the EU, they had a cap-and-trade uh, scheme. They desperately want us to, to participate uh, with them because their emissions went up while ours went down. Uh, there was significant leakage, I think, of jobs. Their, their energy prices did go up. And when we hear from the chairman of AEP, who testified at some point in the last uh, couple of weeks that they thought that their energy prices in Ohio would go up 40 to 50 percent because Ohio uses more than 90 percent coal, and we know that that's the same for Indiana, Michigan's about 60, 65 percent, those costs get passed along. And yes, you can help with it with the subsidies, I guess, run a little bit along the lines of LIHEAP, 
for low-income individuals so that they don't bear the brunt of that higher cost. And Dr. Hayward, I loved your example on cigarettes. But the jobs don't stay. Not when they can go someplace else at a lower cost, knowing that they are competing in a global economy. And so we, what we want to do is, is uh, and there's no off-ramps uh, from my read of this uh, legislation. Yeah, there's some discussion uh, with the idea of allowing us to have an import fee uh, that somehow would be WTO uh, uh, amenable. But again, the jury's out. Uh, I don't know whether that's going to work or not. I have a feeling, Mr. Chairman, that we're going to have a vote on whether or not the administration is, ought to have a 100 percent auction here. Uh, I know the administration supported that in the testimony that they gave in, in the first panel today. Uh, we'll find out where the votes are, of whether that ought to be part of the package, and what happens if, in fact, it's, it's uh, uh, an amendment that is, that is adopted. Uh, Mr. Ebel, your comments, I think, were right on line as, as we look at uh, the costs associated and, and what is going to happen to businesses. Uh, but how do, uh, how do you counter that with Dr. Keown's, uh, is that, am, am I saying that right, Keown? It's not right. Cohan, but it's close. Cohan, all right. Is it spelled right? On the, uh, all right. Uh, I mean, how do you comport that your, your two testimonies together? Dr. Cohan says that it's going to be 7 to 10 cents a day, and yet we, we hear some pretty different numbers when we actually go into the field, at least as we look at the Midwest. Uh, thank you, Representative Upton. Um, I appreciate your leadership on this issue. Um, we know it can't be that inexpensive. If it were that inexpensive, we wouldn't be having these rancorous debates. The fact is that energy prices have to go up significantly if emission cuts are going to be made. Uh, president Obama recognized this when he was running for president, and he said, under my plan of a cap-and-trade system, electricity rates would necessarily skyrocket. Peter Orzag, now the uh, head of OMB, right. uh, then head of CBO, when he testified here, said, this won't work unless prices go up. In the European Union, there has been tremendous consternation about the, the price of the rationing coupons because they yo-yo up and down, and the, the people who want to uh, who are actually serious about making emissions cuts keep pointing out that the price has to stay up in order to force emissions down. When, the, when it keeps yo-yoing up and down, nobody has an incentive to reduce their emissions because they're going to hope that they're going to get some cheap rationing coupons, uh, you know, if not this month, next month. So I just think it is, it, it is beyond believability that this is going to be inexpensive. Uh, it's, it's going to be incredibly expensive. Jeff Cohen, is the answer yes? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, well, with all due respect, I don't. I'm not quite sure how Mr. Ebel knows um, that it can't possibly be as uh, inexpensive as the best analysis we have from the best economic models we have, uh, which is what the EPA analysis represents. Um, that's what those models estimate. Now, sure, there are. Uh, you know, the models aren't perfect, but if you look at the record, we've always overestimated the costs of environmental regulation. That was a finding by some researchers at Resources for the Future who looked at, uh, who found a consistent pattern of, of overestimation. And that's because, frankly, we don't know how to model technological change. And these models, these analyses, can't capture the scope of technological change that we'll see when we use a market-based system that unlocks American innovation. Well, just to close, because my time has expired, it seems like, uh, based on what you just said, maybe we ought to have an amendment that would offer a safety valve that if it goes up more than 20 cents, the, the whole thing will be struck after the enacting clause. Maybe we'll see an amendment like that. Thank you. Great. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the – gentleman is on – the chair is uncertain here. Well, I'm going to continue to recognize uh, members of the minority. Okay, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hall. We can go to Mr. Shimkus if you like, Mr. Hall. I'm sorry that, that I haven't been here because it seems like y'all are having so much fun in here when I got here. Right? Yeah, <laughs> I'll stay a while. I. Uh, I want to ask some questions, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing me, and thank you for accepting that Washington Post item. I appreciate that. 
you know, it's my opinion and the opinion of most of us over here and the opinion of maybe half of you out there that uh, we're going to be in a weakened competitive position in the United States under cap and trade. I believe it deeply and have a lot of reasons to believe it, and, and you all are in responsible positions and know more about your business than I know about your business, but I know your business, man, successful or you wouldn't be here. So I just can't see why you can't understand, if you don't understand, why we wouldn't be in a weakened competitive uh, position under cap and trade as it's written here. Uh, we, uh, I have a, the chairman is a good friend of mine. I like the chairman. Uh, we uh, elect one another, I think. I criticize him in his district, he criticizes me in mine. <laughs> But uh, we have a mutual understanding, and I respect him. I really do. And he's funny. Uh, but China, under the Washington Post, China hopes climate deal omits exports. Now, this, this ought to tell you how China thinks. And, and they're one of the big players. They're the big player in this, other than us. And if they don't play, and I, I mentioned this this morning. It's a little bit maybe uh, simple, but... When you go to Walmarts or uh, or uh, Sears or or your wives go to Neiman's or anywhere, you're going to see a machine as you on your way out and that you got to go buy that machine. It's called a cash register, and you have to pay, and somebody's got to pay, and China has never indicated in one instance that they want to pay their share. And they're polluting the air, as we sit here today. And I think I read the other day where about every sixth day they open a, a plant that uh, is uh, not conducive to, to clean air. Uh, and I'm very pro-coal. I'm, I'm pro-nuclear. Uh, I live in Texas. I'm a, we're fossil fuels there. And I don't know how, how we're going to do away with fossil fuels. Of course, we have to have technology and keep continue to pursue cleansing. Uh, anybody in their right sense knows that. Uh, but anybody that thinks we can just overnight do away with fossil fuels is just dreaming. They're just thinking, uh, and, and it would be wonderful. But that hadn't happened, and, and elements here in Washington and around the country have fought us drilling offshore, fought us drilling in the, off the coast of uh, Florida, fought us from drilling up in and war, uh, and we could. We don't even have to have any help from anybody else. We have plenty right here at home if we could just mine it, and we should have, but we haven't. So we find ourselves in a position where China, one of the big players, not only won't agree to to curtail their polluting the skies, but I think they're insolent enough to indicate, and I'm going to read you a little bit from uh, this uh, Washington Post deal. It says, countries importing Chinese goods should be responsible for the heat trapping gases released during manufacturing, a top Chinese official said yesterday. That was Ling Geo. I don't know if that's the right pronunciation, but that's the way it looks to me. Anyway, he is the uh, climate change, uh, he directs the climate change department at the National Development and and Reform Commission. So he's the top guy, so far as I know, over there. He's their top climate negotiator. And he said that, and he said, as one of the developing countries, we're at the low end of the production line for the global economy. We produce products, and these products are consumed by other countries. This share of emissions should be taken by the consumers, but not the producers. They're not even willing to pay for their own emissions. Now, please take that into consideration when you make your decisions. So. Uh, I'd ask this question, uh, what evidence do, and I'll begin over here, Mr. Ebell, I can't see that far, but Mr. What the hell's his name? Ebell. Mr. Ebell. That's what I thought it said, but I yes. couldn't pronounce it. Uh, what evidence does uh, U.S. CAP have that China and other developing nations will not take strategic advantage of what will be a weakened competitive position of the United States under cap and trade. Uh, Representative Hall, I don't believe that they have any uh, evidence, and in fact, I think uh, they do plan to take 
competitive advantage, and they also want to be paid for their emissions reductions. And I think you can uh, see how expensive it is going to be to reduce emissions because everyone believes it will be cheaper to reduce emissions in developing countries than it will be in the United States. And yet they are talking uh, in the European Union and in China and India about sending hundreds of billions of dollars a year to developing countries to reduce emissions. So the idea that the EPA model is believable, no, it doesn't pass the laugh test. Well, if I can, if I may. It's absolutely an indication, not an indication, it's just proof that they're not going to play fair with us and not going to take care of their emissions. Go ahead, sir. I, I just wanted to say, again, with respect to my fellow panelists, I think the best judges of the businesses uh, and, the, and the competitive positions of the U.S. CAP companies are those U.S. CAP CEOs and, and, and not Mr. Ebel. And I will say uh, there is in this bill, I think these uh, concerns you've laid out are, are real, but the bill has provisions uh, to deal with them. And I think the way forward is for the United States to do what it has always done best, which is to lead. And if we lead on this crucial issue, then we will be producing the next generation of low carbon technologies here at home will be exporting them instead of importing them from others. The gentleman's time has expired. May I make one last statement to the gentleman? Yes, you may. The, the taxpayer, the, uh, the cash register that I spoke about in all of these countries, uh, China, Russia, they're going to walk, you're going to allow them to walk right by the cash register and leave it to the children of, that are unborn today taxes to fall on their backs. I don't believe you really want to do that. I yield back my time. Okay. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate uh, the hearing and being patient. I appreciate the panel for staying uh, as long as you have. Um, a couple things. I asked this question to an earlier panel. Um, does everyone ag agree that India does not have a low carbon fuel standard? Everybody is nodding in agreement with that. Does everyone agree? I'm just doing this for quickly so I can get to other questions. Does everyone agree that China does not have a low carbon fuel standard? Okay. Everybody's shaking their head. Does Mayor, do you agree? Oh, thank you. Uh, what about, uh, does everyone agree that uh, India currently is not under a cap and trade regime? Does everyone agree with that? And Mayor, you too? Okay. Uh, and, and does everyone agree that India is not under a cap and trade regime? Okay, well, I, with heads nodding in assent. Um, the uh, one of our problems is w that, and I've used this terminology numerous times, uh, all the pain and no gain, because there's really a debate about whether countries will comply. If our leadership will spur an international accord, so briefly, uh, do you agree that if we lead, China and India will comply to a low carbon fuel standard and a cap and trade regime? Real quickly, if you can get yes and no, Mr. Ebel, if you head first. Microphone. Be quickly, though, yes or no would be helpful. Yes, I think we can guarantee it if we put a provision in the bill saying it will not go into effect until there is an international agreement that has been ratified that is binding. And, and we used to talk about that. We used to use the terminology of an off-ramp, but uh, that has been jettisoned. I, I, Dr. I will, Cohen. I will Cohen. say if we do not do anything, uh, then they won't take a cap on their own. But if we do lead, uh, that's the only way we'll get No, there. will they? Yes or no, will they if we do lead? I guess is a question. You believe they will? Do, I think if we do lead, China and India China will do it, and and India will both do low carbon fuels and a cap I, and trade. I think I I don't know what mechanism they'll use, but I think if we lead, we will see okay. China and India okay. follow. Great. On Thank a, you, Mr. Doc. Uh, uh, Mr. I, I don't think they will. They certainly won't accept the cap that the EPA assumes, which will be about half of the one we're getting. Okay, Dr. Hayward. I think it's very unlikely. Um, here's the problem. Uh, even in an optimistic scenario, a lot of low carbon technologies that we can afford as a rich country are still going to be more expensive than fossil fuels for developing countries, who, by the way, control about 80 percent of the world's fossil fuels. It takes quite a flight of fancy, it seems to me, to think that they're not going to use those fossil fuels, especially if they get cheaper on the world market as we use less of them. Okay. Mr. Nablock. 
I think we're leaving a vacuum. I think if we lead, they will. China today has a national renewable electricity standard. They have fuel economy standards that are competitive. They're also the building a new power plant, whatever, that, that, coal fire power plant every week. Yes, sir, that, that okay. is so. Okay. But, but if we don't lead, it's assured okay. that they won't. Mr. Chichios, but you think they will comply if we, have, if we move on both I think low carbon fuel and cap and trade regime? I think I think we lead and they and, and we we lead boldly in negotiations and they and they accept a cap, then some of these policies will flow from there. We will okay, Mr. Chichio. Well, I, I don't I don't I don't think so, and particularly for the industrial sector, which is their engine of jobs growth. So I don't think so. Mayor, I, I do believe they will eventually follow because the practices that they are currently engaging. Uh, will are not sustainable environmentally, and it will lead to an environmental. Well, uh, yeah, and I would, and I don't want to debate you, but uh, carbon dioxide is not a toxic pollutant. Uh, I'm sorry, what was that? Uh, carbon dioxide is not a toxic pollutant. Would you agree with that? Uh, it, it is toxic in excessive amounts. It is not. To Does everyone, anyone believe that carbon dioxide is a toxic pollutant? At 15,000, and we're at in the atmosphere right now, 380. Okay, let me let me uh, let me go and. Uh, so much discuss. Let me talk about real jobs for a second. Um, I, I just toured uh, a supercritical new coal-fired power plant um, in Lively Grove, uh, Washington County. Washington County has 15,000 employees. This power plant uh, is right now has 1,200 construction jobs, uh, an additional 400 uh, building a coal mine across the street. They'll have 500 full-time power plant jobs and 400 coal mine jobs once in operation. Those are real jobs that are at risk. Because what happens in carbon dioxide capture and sequestration, 40 percent, and I'll end with this, Mr. Chairman, 40 percent, 100 percent of the electricity output would then be cut to only 60 percent that can go on the market because it's going to take 40 percent of the energy created by this power plant to initiate the carbon capture and sequestration provision, thus limiting its ability to really get a return on the investment. Okay. Gentleman's time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, the ranking member of the full committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not going to ask. I don't think I'll take the full five minutes. Um, Mr. Sissio, is, is it your view that um, there should be no cap and trade program at all? Is that there a fair are, assessment? Uh, we, we uh, as an organization, have not taken a position either for or opposed. What we look at is cost effectiveness. Cost number one, cost number two, cost number three. Uh, in my testimony, I, I said that our industry has done an incredibly good job of continuing to drive down energy consumption and the resulting greenhouse gas emissions. Um, uh, we do not support policies, any policy, a cap and trade policy or any other policy that is not cost effective. Well, then let me an ask it a different way. Can you develop a cap and trade program that doesn't add cost to the economy? No, sir. I would say, in my opinion, that's not possible. Okay. Um, Mr. Hay Haywood, uh, it says that you're a warehouser fellow. That's a um, forestry company. Um, do you think that we can reforest America with enough offsets to cover the um, allowances in a, if we had a cap and trade bill? Um, that didn't give away allowances? That's a terribly complicated question. This House or chair at AEI is something the family set up over 30 years ago. At the same time, they set up a chair at Yale University School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. I don't do that much work on forestry, actually. I do the sludge part of the environment. Um, but I have to look at some numbers of this. Uh, we've actually been reforesting pretty rapidly in this country. Uh, a million acres a year net forest growth in the 1990s, according to a study the Clinton administration set in motion. Um, but uh, it's hard to get some numbers on this, but I think the, the general answer is no, you actually can't take up all of our carbon emissions through carbon sinks, or, but some portion of them. And that, I'm hesitant to, to give you a figure on that, but it's, it's not anywhere near enough to the targets that we're setting out for. I think, Mr. Keon, do you want to answer that? Or are you just looking at him? I 
Well, I, I, I was actually going to highlight the uh, enormous potential for helping to protect the tropical rainforests and in doing so uh, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions there and, uh, and help reduce costs here at home. Yeah, I, I'm not opposed to tropical rainforest protection. My problem with out, within the United States, if we set up an offset program, I'm reasonably confident that we can enforce it and implement it. I'm not as confident overseas. So my problem with the tropical rainforest is not that I don't want to protect them and I wouldn't even, and I'd even be willing to figure out a way to give some credits if we could ensure that um, they would actually be enforced and implementable in those countries. And I don't have that confidence level overseas. That's my problem with what you just said. Well, I, 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 I agree that enforcement and verification is, is crucial, but I think we have the satellite monitoring and the on-the-ground monitoring to do that reliably. Okay, my last question, I'm going to ask this to my friend at the Heritage Foundation. Um, if we have a renewable energy standard or a clean energy standard, uh, should we include uh, nuclear power? Uh, yeah, I don't understand why that gets left out. If, if the goal is CO2 and CO2 is the worry, nuclear produces essentially zero CO2 per kilowatt what about, hour. What about clean coal technology? Um, clean coal technology, as uh, Mr. Shimkus pointed out, is pretty expensive. Right now, we don't have, uh, those of us at Heritage, and I don't speak for Heritage, but I know that some of the people I talk with are, are doubtful that it will be commercially available any time in the next couple of decades. That's our but concern. But theoretically, it, it is the, the, the science is there, uh, but you have to do something in addition to pulling it out of the affluent. You have to put uh, essentially several super tankers per day worth of compressed uh, liquefied CO2 someplace. Thank you. Thank I you, think Mr. that's a problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I thank the gentleman very much. And we thank the panel for your expert uh, testimony. And if you would, you, you please remain available because um, over the next several weeks, we would like to rely upon your expertise. Thank you all so, so much for your expertise today. And uh, we are going to now uh, ask the, uh, the next panel to uh, come up to uh, testify uh, as well before the panel.